Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us at Coalesce. My name is Amada Echeverria, and I'm on the community team at DBT Labs. I'll be the MC for this session titled, But I Won't Do That, Things You Shouldn't Do with DBT. Our speaker is Randy Pitcher, but you already know that. <laughs> yep. Senior Solutions Architect at DBT Labs is his title. <laughs> there are so many things I could say about Randy Pitcher, but I'll keep it simple. Randy is a Minesweeper pro. He also wants you to know that he is unfazed by hot peppers. Hope we get to test that on this trip. A reminder that all chat conversations and Q&A will take place in the Coalesce But I Won't channel of DBT Slack. If you're not in Slack, you have time to join right now at community.getdbt.com and search for Coalesce But I Won't once you're in. NOLA attendees. Please be aware that we are 30 seconds ahead of the folks watching online, so try, to best, try your best to refrain from, sh from sharing any spoilers in the chat. After the session, Randy will join the Slack channel for a couple hours to answer your questions. Let's get started. Over to you, Randy. Hey, everyone. You hear me okay? Yeah. <clears throat> good. Good, good, good. Hi. Um, I'm Randy. <clears throat> And uh, this wonderful person with me in every photo is uh, Penelope Jane, who's watching live. So uh, she got out of school early for this. Hi, Penny. And uh, hi, Lily. Um, isn't this nuts? Uh, <laughs> she's going to get a kick out of this. Um, and yeah, I work for DBT Labs. I'm a solutions architect, which is um, mumbo jumbo for a uh, sales engineer, right? Um, I help people who are considering what version, uh, flavor of DBT is right or not right for them, and that's cool. Um, and then, I don't know, it's just, it's the sickest job. And today I wanted to talk to you about things that I don't get to do in my job very often, uh, and that is um, show people how to do the wrong thing. Um, I, I wanted to break some rules with uh, like a normal demo. Um, anyway, and, and some of you might wonder, like, why do this? Why show people a bunch of things that you don't think should be done? And, and, Part of it is because you only live once. <laughs> and if you're not going to do it here, coalesce amongst friends, where are you going to do it? Um, and also, uh, a little bit of a spoiler, but you all get it 30 seconds early. Um, one of these is kind of a good idea on accident. Uh, anyway, we'll talk about that. Um, and and an another note on this. Um, I'm, as far as style goes, you're going to see a lot of bad style today. Um, so... It <laughs> Keep that in mind. I, I'm doing things that I think um, should not necessarily be done with DBT. There are other ways to do them, but if you were going to do them, this is how. And that was the original title of the talk, that long, um, before uh, Lauren Craigie uh, came up with this really good meatloaf reference, and I am a huge meatloaf fan. So I kind of ran with it, and uh, we're going to do some music stuff today. So I don't have as much time as I uh, would take. I'd take two, three hours to cover a lot of this stuff. Um, so we're going to keep it simple. We're going to stick to three major things. Um, and, and I should probably apologize a little bit because uh, I noticed that, oh my gosh. Um, I, I noticed that it said uh, this is maybe like a beginner's welcome thing, and it totally is. Please, beginner's you know, welcome. Um, but this is not, I'm not going to explain everything I'm doing as far as like how the SQL works and how the macros work and all that. We're just going to try to stick to like the basic concepts. And then if you're interested in any of this, all the code is public, online, good, bad, ugly, help yourself to it. Um, sound good so far? Everyone okay with that? Yeah? All right. Um, who likes stored procedures? Liars. You're liars. I know you like them. Because um, they, they kind of feel like something that could be a good idea named code reduction, reusability. Why do they suck so much? Um, that's a topic for another talk because I'm going to do them anyway. And uh, my advice here is to store your stored procedures procedurally. Um, if you are going to use them, <laughs> um, be consistent. And uh, sure, we're going down into the details on this one. And um, good, bad, or ugly, I think it is a lo mejor, which is for the best. Um, that we get started with this talk already. All right. Um, DBT Cloud, this is the editor. Um, that's legible enough, right? You don't have to read it all. Okay, so let's talk about the first thing, stored procedures. Why are they tricky? Um, 
I think uh, historically a lot of imperative code ends up bundled up into sort of procedures. That's like just a fundamental problem for me. So uh, imperative uh, in this context, I'm really just talking about you are really owning every little step of every little thing that's gonna happen. Stored procedures are gonna run single threaded, so they're gonna cost a little more money. Um, it takes a lot of mental overload if uh, you wanna update one to add in a new column. Well, what if you put it before the parent, right? I mean, things that with DBT we don't have to worry about, but with stored procedures, you have to really understand this procedure. And they tend to get long, right? Thousands of lines of code, I don't know if anyone has seen that. And a lot of people, I, I do sales, right? So I see what people are working with today and what they might like to do in the future. Stored procedures are by far the number one alternative to DBT that I see, by far. And when people have CICD, what they really mean is they just overwrite the prod version of the stored procedure <laughs> and hope it doesn't break. So cool. Well, I, uh, we live in this world, there are going to be stored procedures, people who are adapting to DBT, especially in the enterprise, which is uh, the group I work with the most, they are going to use stored procedures. And if you can help them ease that transition, you know, maybe they'll stop. So the first thing I wanted to show you is, um, well, it's a custom materialization. Why is that important? Because DBT doesn't want to do any of this and you've got to break it. You really got to force it to do some of these things. Anyone here wrote a custom materialization before? They're not that hard. Um, ju they just look scary because the ones on, on DBT core support like an endless number of warehouses. But if you're just writing for one, it just is kind of like a little bit more of a headache of Jinja and knowing where everything connects. So in this one, this is uh, the materialization I use for every custom materialization that I will eventually build. And the reason is this is just raw SQL, um, which might be a little controversial in here. You can just run scripts of SQL in DBT. You, it's no problem at all. And that's what this does. This is, I, I set the materialization to raw SQL. It's not gonna take my select statement and, and put it into some DDL. It's gonna run however many lines of SQL one by one that I tell it to run, right? So this is really important. So you're getting kind of a view here of how I elevate up. The other thing that I like to do, uh, if you only have one or two stored procedures, there's nothing wrong with just a, a macro, right? Um, where you can come into here and you can create that DDL. This is creating um, a, a stored procedure that's gonna return a couple digits of pi, right? Um, I actually have a pi tattoo. Yeah, not a lot of people know that. Um, <laughs> yeah, all right. So um, that's what this does. This, this just generates a static stored procedure. Uh, the cool part about it is that it's dynamic, meaning that when I deploy in production, it's gonna go to production, but if I'm in dev, it's in my local version, so I can screw it up and no one else has to know. Um, so cool, these are the two components for this. Uh, the first thing with a, a stored procedure, you gotta define it and then you gotta call it, right? It, it's not the same thing as a table where once you define it and it exists, you're, you're done. You don't call a table. Someone else is gonna read it. But with stored procs, you have to have that. So one way to do that is bundle it up in a macro and then you can go anywhere that you would want to run code like this. You can either have it execute itself, which is what I do, and then return its own name. That way I know for a fact, anytime I call this function, the stored procedure already exists. It has to, because this redefines it. So it's a lot like a view, because it doesn't take a lot of time to just overwrite a stored procedure. Um, so that's kind of what I'm gonna do. You can use this as a pre-hook, a post-hook, uh, on-run start. So in the project YAML, uh, I'm gonna jump to. If I wanna get the result of pi, I, I can just, I haven't commented out because it's annoying to show pi all the time. But that's what this is, call stored procedure pi. Um, this is a really bad, naive first example though. This is, it doesn't make it useful, it's not a part of the DAG, there's no ordering. Um, I have no visibility onto which things rely upon this, not that good. So let's take that raw SQL and let's move into models land. So down here, I'm gonna open a model. I, I, uh, I spent a lot of time making it organized and easy to traverse. Um, so in here, stored procedure. So this would be an example of me defining one and calling it right away, right? And it's the same basic building blocks we had before, but instead of having it call at the beginning of a, a total run, this can be a member of the DAG. So I'm gonna make raw SQL, which means it's gonna execute anything that's in here. And then the post hook, I'm, it's calling itself. Um, this should feel disgusting to you, <laughs> if you know what's going on here. Uh, I don't know if anyone's on the, on the PS team in here. Um, this is bad. Um, but it's the same logic, right? We're gonna return some pi, a little less pi this time, sorry. Um, that's how it worked. So then let's, let's make this a little bit better. 
what if I wanted other objects to have dependency relationships? Like there's something about this object, and this is um, just a child object, and I can pull open the lineage here. Um, I have two different child objects. That doesn't mean that I want this stored procedure necessarily to run twice, right? And that would be the hard part about just injecting that into those run hooks. So what I've done, which is a bad idea, I cannot explain this, this is a bad idea. Um, I just, in the child object, <laughs> commented out a reference to the stored procedure. <laughs> uh, and that means that <laughs> these tables will run after this. It means that the DAG ordering will be preserved. Um, and you can have stored procedures all day long. Uh, the, the perverse part about this is that if we go all the way to that beginning easy part where you had a, a macro like this, if you just write SQL instead of this, this wild DDL, um, a macro will serve as a stored procedure and you can actually run it as a run operation. You can do whatever you want with it. I do all my cleanup with that kind of thing. So that's what you should do, but that's not what the, the title of this talk. Um, how are we doing? We're doing okay. We're doing okay. Feeling good? All right. Any questions about this in the room? It's okay. Yeah, it, there shouldn't be any questions because this is a, a bad thing to do. Um, all right, let's move on to something I think a little more interesting, if that's okay. Um, let me change my tabs. Okay, let's move on. Um, who here has written an incremental model? Anyone? Okay, how do they all end? They all end with a is incremental check, right? Every single time, same thing. Not always, if you're doing something really complex, you're right, and you don't always want it to. But if you're like me, I break my CTs up so that they always end the same way. Um, so let's talk about incrementals. Uh, it's a pretty common thing, people ask me, like, how do, like, okay, we got DBT, it's working, it's good, how do we turn all of these into incrementals? And you probably shouldn't do that. Um, there are a lot of really good reasons for that. Number one just being that um, data engineering is iterative. We don't know everything about our data until we get in there and start using it. We don't know what the business cases are until we build something that someone who understands the business context can look at and tells us that like, okay, canceled orders are one piece of the pie, but code negative 14 also means canceled. I know you didn't know that. So you have to go back and you have to do it. And for iterative processes, the more calcification you put on writing those custom, either complex ones for the is incremental checks, or even just the vanilla ones, even if you try to template it pretty good, it's not as easy as just jumping from table to view, right? Back and forth, table to view. You just change a config. Ephemeral, I actually had, for this talk, it's the first time I've ever had to use an ephemeral, but they exist. And um, anyway, incrementals, I think about the data and I can feel it coming. New data every day. Um, and the really cool thing about this is I thought this was a bad idea, but something I built from here, um, I actually PR'd it against Core last week because I think it's pretty sick. Um, but it's optional, don't do it, but if you're gonna do it, this is a pretty cool option. So that's me being on the bright side of things. Um, okay, let's jump back in. So I'm gonna close all of this. Um, has anyone here used the new IDE yet? Or you, have you all seen this? It's pretty sick, right? <laughs> okay, so again, let's start with macros. Um, you're going to see that I'm doing a lot of custom materializations, and it's because every one of these bad ideas are going to require me to break dbt a little bit. Not that custom materializations break it necessarily, it's just if you're doing a custom materialization, it might be a good, just pause, just think for a second, like, is there an easier way to do this? Sometimes no, but sometimes yeah. So with incrementals, um, I got pretty tired of constantly rewriting the same logic where you're gonna grab everything that's greater than or equal to the last process timestamp every time. And DBT is really good at getting rid of boilerplate code. So here's a somewhat more complex incremental, uh, or I'm sorry, materialization. Uh, and one of the major things I'm doing that you should never, ever, ever do for any reason is overwriting a default materialization. I should have called this something different, but. That's not what we're doing today. Um, something that's really interesting, I thought, is that the configs that you see, so like if you go to a, um, uh, any, any model and there's a config that allows you to define a, a unique key, right, for normal incrementals. This is all that is. You can call it whatever you want. You, you can put, you can make it required, you can make it optional. Um, I used to call this watermark and then I was getting, gearing. this is what I PR'd by the way, this changed to incrementals. Um, and I said, okay, there's unique key that already exists. What do we call this incremental key? 
And if you provide it, you don't have to. If you don't, this guy can still put it exactly where it's supposed to be and get the most um, uh, efficiency out of the query. But I find that most of the time, for most people, you just need that slipped in there uh, and change a config. You don't have to change your SQL at all. So that's what I did here. Grab the incremental key. All this stuff is mostly boilerplate. I, it, it intimidated me a lot, mostly because it's Jinja. And Jinja, like, <laughs> kind of sucks at this scale. I mean, it's great for one or two lines, but it, I just wish I could have written some Python. Um, anyway, so in here, uh, the only thing I have to care about is when the incremental already exists and I have to do something special with it. When it doesn't exist, I'm just creating a table. So I didn't have to edit any. I copy and pasted this from the DBT core project. You can go see all the default um, materializations there. So uh, the, the magic piece, which again, don't be intimidated by this stuff because it's so easy. If there's an incremental key defined, uh, meaning like it's not nothing, then I'm just gonna go ahead and add that boilerplate that we always talk about. I don't have to add a check though on whether this is, is incremental because this code only runs during incremental processes. I know that because of this else. Everything else is, well dang, if there's a view, we should delete it and then create a table and then we do an initial population and then we're done. But if we come back and it's like an incremental process and all the columns line and everything's good, we should just add that. So that's what we did. Um, the best way to think about it is, let's go to some incremental sources. Um, you all know your Zodiac sign? Um, I like Zodiac data a lot, and it's because a lot of people are familiar with it. It includes date times, which is fun. And for machine learning, um, I can feed in 100 years of date to corresponding uh, Zodiac sign, and then I can tell right away how easy, hard, good, bad a given predictive model is, because <laughs> uh, I'm lazy. So uh, down here, I've got just some timestamps. This is a table. That means that the timestamps will be preserved. But if I made a view, every time I process this, each record is going to look brand new. It's going to look like it's just the newest records. So preview, it doesn't really kind of matter. Um, it's it's going to look the same in the preview. And then delineage, <laughs> yeah, when you do stuff that I'm about to show you, your lineage just looks disgusting. It looks bad. But I'm going to go into the Zodiac incremental and show you how this works. So there's no unique key at this time, uh, meaning that I'm gonna do append-only processing. If I had a unique key in here, I could do a differentiated upsert, meaning that DBT would handle, is this a update to an existing record or is this a brand new record that should be added as opposed to updated? Um, when you don't define the unique key, you just, it's append-only. And that makes it really easy for us to see what's happening. Now, down here at the bottom, this select star from the incremental source, I do this so that I can control, I don't have a live, live set of new data to show you. And so when I preview this, it looks not that interesting, right? It's just the same stuff. If this were a table, I could switch it to a view. If it's a view, I could switch to ephemeral. And now, because I have that incremental override, I could switch it to an incremental. I don't have to change the SQL. So this process that column, this is the one that I really care about. So when I build this out, the first time, I have a pass-through, and you gotta have pass-throughs because they show you what's in the content of the incremental rather than what would be in the content if you ran it from scratch right now. So when I go in here and hit preview, I can see, I added some colors to the, the Zodiac so that we have like almost a, a pseudo dimension associated with the Zodiac, but they're, they're static, they're the same all the time. And so in here, when I'm looking at it, I have the processed at times, and those are uh, 247, Okay, so that's off by like a time set, that's fine. Um, and then we have the colors, purple. So these are all purple, I have 48 rows, and that's because I've ran this four times, there are 12 zodiac signs. So if I run it again with a different color, well I don't even have to have a different color, uh, but a different time would be really good. So I've got a view, um, that means that every time that I run it as a view, it'll have a new timestamp. And from here I can do a build. It's already saved. I love this new, I'm not trying to do a commercial, I really am just an excited user of this stuff. Um, I like that I can just say build up and downstream <laughs> so I can build basically everything in the lineage here. Um, that's gonna go down at the bottom, it's gonna kick it off, and then at, at the end of that, my incremental outputs will be ready to preview. And they should have 60 entries now and a, a new timestamp. But it'll only have processed that new that new record. So we go to the pass through. I preview this. Oh, it failed. Good. 
No, it was just an undefined error. Thank goodness. That was close. Oh. <laughs> and so now we have 60 rows, right, that came in. So you could have just taken my word for it. I guess I didn't have to show you this, but I'm details-oriented, even when I'm doing terrible things. Um, so, yeah, this is a new timestamp. So this is now at 333. Um, I thought my uh, timestamp logic was off, but no, that's just from before my demo. All time has ceased to um, mean anything to me now. I'm very nervous. <laughs> um, but, okay, you all follow this? Not rocket science. Now, why wouldn't you want to do this? That's a really good question. Um, I built this so that I could apply it to the entire project. And as long as you use a consistent naming convention for that process that time, I, I like the term watermark, and I'll just go through everywhere and validate every single table has a watermark column. That's audit. That's a really fun thing you should do with macros. Um, and then I realized, OK, maybe someone would try to do that. But more realistically, it was so easy for me to do what I'm about to show you because when I was ready to incrementalize some of the, lead, the like slower performing parts of it, I just changed the config and I, I let it use the default. I set an environment variable for the, um, the incremental key. So we have, we have about 10 minutes left. I, I didn't think we would get to this next part. Um, who here uses monotonically increasing IDs? Auto increment. I see some head shaking. That is the correct response. A lot of people, and I think it's because on uh, non-distributed systems, this probably wasn't as big a deal, um, like SQL Server, for example. Um, a lot of people expect ID columns to be numeric and increase by one every single time, one, two, three, four, five. And a lot of my job is talking to people who live in that world. That's the world they know. And they are being asked to consider a new world. And uh, I'm, I, I I probably couldn't sell much of anything other than DBT because I, um, I don't know how to sell things I, I don't believe in, which sounds like a commercial. I, I, I have a mic. I wish I could take it off and just get down here. Um, so when I'm, when I'm talking to people like that, there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of resistance. And it's not because they're bad or evil or, or whatever. Um, it's because no one likes to change. People despise it. We hate changing. I will do anything to not change, including having worldviews that don't align with reality, as long as it confirms how I see myself. Ooh. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, I'm not wearing a microphone. I know it, but I, I wanted to do that. Um, anyway, cognitive dissonance. Um, thank you. One semester of persuasion at Purdue. Um, Anyway, so a lot of what that requires is talking to them where they're at and validating and understanding why you might want to do something like this. Uh, and it's because they're easy to validate. The problem with them, the major problem in a distributed system, is that you have no guarantee that your records will be in the same order if you have to reprocess. So that means those IDs, which are everywhere in your other tables to link up to this one, they're foreign keys in other places, if you run it in dev, they just might match to other stuff. And that's why typically we like to do a surrogate key. It's a, it's a hash, right? You take a combination of columns that represent uniqueness, including even just like a normal, uh, typically generated ID or a UUID, if you, you've seen those. Um, and that's what we typically do. But if you are really insistent, and I have some people who, as part of evaluating DBT, they insist, if DBT can't do it, it's a deal breaker. And I want to be like, all right, then it's, it's a deal breaker. See ya. Like, um, because asking if DBT can do something is a really dangerous question, because it, it can. <laughs> uh, and that's where um, mids come in. Uh, and I think, I think they're mid. I, I don't think they're that good. Um, uh, they're right in the middle. And that might be me going against the wind a little bit for some folks. But trust me, you're going to be much happier with uh, hash IDs. And let me show you why. So um, this is the one that took the most time by far, and it's still not perfect. The problem with it is I've only made it consistent for me or for a specific production deployment. That means that forever and always now, my two environments can have no, I, I can't do deference here because the IDs in production, they're consistent for production, but they do not match the numeric IDs I have. To do that, we would have to have some delegated, super massive key lookup table that is the same for all environments at all times. Uh, and is gov it's just, it's a nightmare. You could do it, but it would be its whole own talk. So I said, you know what, let's, let's, let's cut the big guy some slack uh, and maybe just make it consistent for my environment. So that's what we do. 
First thing that we're going to do here, um, we're going to build on some stuff we did before, and we're going to use a raw SQL materialization. This is where I always start, and if you are thinking about custom materializations, I recommend this. Get the DDL working the way you normally would, and then look at what stuff is repetitive, and then cut that out into a materialization so you don't have to write it. And if you don't find a lot of that, maybe it shouldn't be a materialization, maybe it should be a macro. All right, five minutes. We're actually doing really good. So first thing I do is I want to set a name. I like to make this really explicit. Um, for normal materializations, this is done for you through DBT, but when I'm doing DDL like this, like raw, I have to be aware of what database, schema, and name I'm going to use. Now luckily, I can just refer to this. The, this object is gold. It's so much fun. It just says, whatever the current config, I don't know, for this database is, use that. And so that means I don't have to rewrite a bunch of logic DBT will already do for me. And then down here, just like with our DDL for the stored procedure, uh, except this is, I think, much more comforting because uh, I use tables. Um, and we're going to have a, a, a mid right here, which is the ID. The DDL that I had to write here, the reason I couldn't just use a, um, a table and add a little extra ginger in there is because I needed to define this special piece of DDL logic. I'm using Snowflake for this. They make it easy. If you're not using Snowflake, um, uh, it's not a big deal at all. Under the hood, it's just a sequence, right? And that's what we've all kind of done by hand forever. You just set it some default value. Uh, some systems have it built in. Other systems, you've got to build it, but it's not a big deal. Um, and if I had to build a sequence, I, I would just make a custom materialization. Cool. Um, so in here, this is what it is. Now, the problem with this is that I cannot define this after the table has data in it. I tried. Um, it won't backpropagate. So that means your table has to know that that mid is always going to be an auto increment starting at one, going up by one for now and for always. And then the rest of the task is to make sure that those mappings persist. So if I reprocess this whole thing, this table may go away, but I need to remember whether or not a record has been assigned uh, a mid or whether it needs one. And so rather than being smart uh, and writing anything uh, impressive, I actually just put some lineage together um, that does a circular reference, which you should never do. So I create this object. I use its results to populate which things are fresh. So it's an incremental process. And out of those fresh things, which things need a mid. And of those mids, I do a manual insert statement. Oh, it's gross. Come look. Uh, <laughs> So in here, I'm going to grab everything from that same uh, Zodiac set, but you can't tell that here, and you won't even see in the lineage necessarily that it relies on the Zodiac, except I used my comment hack again. And uh, just by having a ref, it's going to order it, so that's perfect. The next step is the unprocessed records. This looks like I broke an incremental part because it's kind of what I did. I'm going to grab everything from that base table that currently has nothing in it. I'm going to generate a natural key which um, I, I could have done in a macro. I just combined zodiac sign and the color. And then I grab every other field associated with it. Don't care. If it changes over time, that's fine. I don't care. From that source, that incremental source, where I am getting the zodiac from, and where the processed at time is greater than the current max processed of that empty table. Now, the first time I run it, it'll be null, right? There's nothing. So I coalesce to a zero. That's, um, anyone know what zero is, timestamp wise? January 1st of 1970, anyone? Yeah, Epoch, what's going on? That's the fake birth date I, I tell Netflix um, <laughs> that I am. Cool. Um, so then let's, let's move on a little bit from here. So this is going to contain, at this point, everything unprocessed. So when I run it the first time, it contains everything, all the data. If I run it in a week, it's only going to contain what I haven't handled yet. we got two minutes. We're doing good. Um, and now let's grab out of the things that have not been processed, which of them need a key. And if you know me, you know I hate joins. I will do anything to not write a join. It's because I got started in Spark. And I'm not talking about Databricks Spark, which is nice and easy and fun and good to use and interactive. I'm talking about, no, Hortonworks isn't around anymore, is it? Oh, Cloudera owns them. Sorry, I'm not going to offend anybody. But I use old Hortonworks and PySpark. And the worst thing you can do in the world is do a join. So um, that persists to this day. But anyway, I do. I, the same thing you would do. You do an outer join, you look for the missing things, right? So anything that doesn't have a mid, it's there. Now, why is my config at the bottom here? It's because this is where I do the insert, and it is, it wasn't as gross as I thought it would be. I was pretty concerned about it. So uh, to do this, post hook, after this is created, that means that this contains all of the records I need to insert. And when you insert 
this specific way without defining the mid, because I set up that DDL, it will auto assign the mid for me. So my role has gotten a lot easier for generating that monotonically increasing ID, which is the most exciting phrase. Um, and, and so I, I can run this, I preview this, this is gonna return only those unmarked records. Now, I haven't changed the source since I last ran this. I expect this to return um, absolutely nothing. Uh, and then the syntax is, of course, screwing up because it's live. But, oh, 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 I know why. Um, we pushed a, a thing that it'll run only your highlights, and I keep highlighting things and wondering why it's breaking, and it's because I'm only running a, a portion of it. Okay, so at this point, we need the pass-through. And this returns zero rows. This is the culmination of my talk. I am going one minute over, um, which I will pay dearly for in the future. <laughs> Don't laugh at that. That was such a dumb joke. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong one. So now I'm going to go back here and to simulate uh, my incremental source changing, I'm actually going to change from purple to rainbow because there's a five-year-old watching who loves rainbow. Hi, Penny. Um, so from here, I'm going to build everything downstream. My expectation at this time, before I run it, I'm going to show you what the data currently looks like. The pass-through is going to show me what that back reference looks like. And I, all I've done is prettified. I, I put it in our current time zone, and I truncated it to the minute because no one wants to see like milliseconds in a, in a demo. Um, and I'll just look at the records, and then I would expect that whatever this is, it'll increase by 12. Everything will get a new numeric ID. Uh, process at times will increase, and it's basically production ready. Uh, let me get that preview. Um, while that's running, meanwhile, back at the ranch. Ah, oh, gosh, see, it doesn't like that every single time. So this will demonstrate that. When I go back and change and build from the incremental source, build downstream here. Looking at the lineage, which in this case is actually quite fun. There we go. Um, we're gonna, we can, we can feel it coming, right? So new Zodiac data, right, in the incremental source, because I've taken the, the static data and I've appended a different color, rainbow. Rainbow is gonna flow into the mid, um, but actually it won't directly. Mid is just reliant to run after this. Mid's gonna do nothing because the table already exists. I don't want it to delete it. From there, we are going to be mid unprocessed rows. And that's not rocket science. Just grab everything that's new, right? And so in this case, that will contain 12 records with rainbow, right? From there, we're going to D with C being the key map. Why is the key map important? Because if this table disappears, I need to know how to map your mid to the actual natural key for future consistency. Then I join those and I grab everything that doesn't have a, an entry in the key map. And then I reverse insert, that's a circular dependency, which you can't see, because then, then it wouldn't be a DAG anymore. Hey, who changed this to lineage graph? Huh? The graphs allow cycles. Uh, that's a little, a little graph theory humor. And <laughs> um, finally, our rainbow gets processed, and then in, in Snowflake, um, I can actually show you here at the end. Oh, and I highlighted it again. Dang it. Oh, beans. <laughs> Keep doing it. I told you I wasn't joking. It, it's screwing me up. It is a cool feature. It helps me, uh, but it hurts me too. All right. We're going to just move on from that. So at this point, um, we've talked about a couple things, and you may be wondering, um, is that it? No, I had so many more ideas, and I still went over time. So... Um, if you're interested in these kind of things, I don't know, I can't promise I will build this content, but I was thinking maybe Jackie uh, in the room, maybe we could do these, right? That would be kind of fun. Uh, she's in marketing at the company. Um, and with that, I'll leave you with one last message. Goodbye, I love you. Um, it was really nice to see you all. Um, uh, Penny loves getaway car, so we had to show getaway car. And my wife and I really like night moves, Bob Seeger. I'm a Bob Seeger guy. Um, and if you want any of this code, it's here. So thank you for attending this. Seriously, um, this is pretty thick content, right? Um, but I'm glad I did it. Thanks.